opportunity to hear from both of those artists. Um, but today is going to be an opportunity to talk about how our identities um, and our cultural history informs how we create and make art. Um, and on a larger scale, how that art then can transform um, the folks that experience the art um, to think about and think through a lens of equity uh, in how we create work, but then how we just move about in our everyday life. Uh, let's, let's just find out who's in the audience. Do we have any current students in the audience? Okay, we got some current students. Uh, what about alum? How are alum? We got a couple of alum. And then I hear there's some parents and grandmas and aunties out in the house. Um, as you all listen to today's conversation, I hope you really reflect upon your own identities, and your own cultural history, and how that informs, for those of us who are artists, how our art shows up and how we make the art. Um, but for those of us who are not, how does our identity inform how we move about in the world? Um, and what does that impact have on other folks? Right. So, welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> Um, so, uh, just a couple of things before we get started. We'll talk about 40 to 45 minutes. Um, bless you, bless you. Um, and we'll be sure to provide time at the end if you have burning questions as you experience today. Today's not your typical. So we start off with the performance. We'll get some slides in to see some, some uh, old life uh, brought to life today. Uh, and we'll be able to also watch a couple of videos. So today won't be, won't be your average conversation. Um, and for folks who uh, frequent conversation online, be sure to follow CalArts on all the various platforms at CalArts. Um, and this weekend's hashtag, I believe, is CalArts Mafia. CalArts Mafia. A good mafia, but a CalArts Mafia. Cool. Um, so with that, I'm going to start with well, how about I'll start with you, Ty. First, can you just tell us what we just, just experienced? What did we just experience? Sure, yes. Yeah. So, welcome, everyone. Thanks, Nigel. I just want to give a shout out to Nigel. I feel a vibration. So much love for Nigel for contextualizing sort of the experience about what, what just happened. And I think, um, you know, a lot of the way in which we like to work is sort of um, decolonizing different spaces. And when you had said, you know, like not your average. Um, panel or average show or average piece you know the question I think we always ask when creating pieces is for who average for who and who can gain the most access to something so it's quite interesting what you just experienced actually is a ritual and ceremony um, and just welcoming people together so you know we like to just uh, uh, in that way to create a sense of uh, smell sight and sound uh, gateways to invite people to come experience like a show or performance or story so we've got a two-part collaborative team, and I want to start with Heather, hopefully it will work, yes, um, Heather and Hi. Uh, yes. could you tell us who you are, where are you from, um, but in particular, how did you discover art? Oh, wow, um, so uh, my name is Heather Beth Henson, I um, have been in a puppet. I've been in art for a long time. I, both my parents appreciated art. Um, my um, my both parents had gone to um, 
worth arts. So um, I came here to Cal Arts for theater. But um, let me see, my art has always been about nature. I've been really focused on a lot of um, finding inspired by nature. And um, but I was in a puppet family, and so my father was a puppeteer, and so I was doing. I didn't actually do any puppetry myself. My first love was I was trying to do animation and drawing and animation, and then it was when I did my final project in animation, not here, somewhere else at RISD. Then I took that same story and I did it in puppets, and I found that that visceral connection I did with all nature materials, and then that was my um, I grown up in puppetry, but then using puppetry to apply to this, my own stories I wanted to tell. And then that got me hooked on puppetry. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So. <laughs> I mean, you, we know you started a company. In, yes, in, in 2000. 2000. I started a company called Ibex Puppetry. So in this company, um, we've been making some of my own shows, and also we've been using it to nurture communities, because communities is really big. Um, and community engagement, and so the one of the one of the many communities I kind of grew up around was the puppet community. So we have been nurturing um, like other people making puppet slams, which is kind of definitely community engagement, keeping all these puppet communities together, doing shows, and then um, handing puppetry, which is puppet films, and then in my own work um, with other people, it's been then just kind of developing shows and getting them on stage. So I was talking to Heather earlier about being an artist with a business. Um, can you tell us how it is being an entrepreneur and providing opportunities for other artists to do what they do well? Um, it's stressful. Uh, <laughs> it's stressful and I can't really always figure it out. And I feel like I'm always learning and I'm constantly asking people how else they do it. Um, it's not always easy. Um, and, you know, as Ty and I are trying to decom, like this whole thing, but trying to find a different system, and that this is a system we are in this business system, and then trying to figure out how to pay people and get income and um, taxes and, um, <laughs> and, and all of that configuration is, um, and there's systems that you get put into, and like, so when we did our last show, it was like a, a system, and then we're trying to then break out of the system, but the business is a system. I mean, we're all in this capital system that we now have all of these talents that we have and reasons for being alive and what, you know, we are alive and breathing beings, but we are then in, in this, operating in this um, capitalized system. And a business system is just one of them. Yeah. I can tell you how admirable it is for a leader to recognize the systems that exist mm -hmm. um, and try to work against those systems or recreate yes. those systems or dismantle those systems that can be yeah. um, uh, not as accessible um, for yeah. as many folks as possible. Yeah. Ty, I want to bring you in. Um, so we got to hear a little bit about Heather, how she got to be in her nature walks with her father. Um, <laughs> Ty, where are you from? Uh, tell us about you. How did you tap into the art world? All right, Nigel. <laughs> um, so I guess I'll say this: it's um, Uju Anine Jiayan, the Jigen Dishna Kaz was swagan and then do Japan Magiza and then do them. Wabanum Jamu Naga Binum and Oki Wedinum, me Gwetchka Ega Kenegego, a bugging in the Gadego Marking, me Gwetchki Jemanido, a Dapanan Aal Asema. And um, I introduce myself in this way, and just in case there are any uh, Ojibwe language speakers here, uh, or folks from Minnesota, or <laughs> Canada, um, <laughs> this is, you know, it's like a language I grew up with that explains my identity, who I am, uh, showing up in spaces. So I grew up on a subsistence community on the reservation, which means you live off of the land. You get your own food and fish and things like that. My mom was a hardcore badass activist um, who worked on the Indian Child Welfare Act and sort of, um, you know, I guess art entered my life going back and forth from uh, urbanized communities to the reservation to subsistence communities. She was like a ceramics teacher at one point and we had lots of brothers and sisters at one point with singing and dancing um, on the weekends at powwows and celebrations. And um, how I came to CalArts was sort of 
you know, follow in the spirit, I guess. Um, I actually ended up in um, Orange County, not knowing where CalArts was. <laughs> oh, you, you told me this That's story. That's great. <laughs> you told me this story. Yeah, so, well, I, so. I had no idea where this, you know, unicorn art making place was. <laughs> and um, ended up there, met a guy named John, who ran the Blue Shuttle. Um, and we looked like each other. He was a Latino guy. And I was like, okay. <laughs> he bought me tacos and drove me all the way up to Cal Arts to I could have a new <laughs> So I know, right? It's so cool. It's so, so John. <laughs> so yeah, and then that's how I how I ended up um, at Cal Arts. Um, but art has always been a part of my life and um, the way I choose to live. Um, and also activism as well with my teachers and mentors um, and different people doing cultural exchanges um, around language, song, dance, storytelling, and art making. And um, mostly about, you know, small things like changing the world. Small things. <laughs> very, very small things. Heather talked about the systems that exist, uh, both just in just everyday life, but also show up in our art making and then influence how the world sees the art. Um, you lead with a framework around decolonization. Mm -hmm. For folks who don't know what that is, can you tell us what decolonization is? And then how do you use that framework as you create work, uh, but then as folks who are experiencing the work, how are they also a part of that framework in terms of decolonizing? Yeah, so this is a term, I think, which is used, I think, in a, in a sort of semi-radical way in terms of talking about um, these systems that were set in place, set up for folks who where institutions and ways of operating weren't meant to be a part of. Most often we hear this around predominantly white institutions, um, not set up for people of color. Um, and this is, I think, like some of the things that I lead with in, in during the art making. Although these systems can be set up, you know, and your identity and privileges too can be for also women where systems aren't set up for, you know, that sort of gender piece. So it's kind of always evaluating what are ways at which we can uh, decolonize space, art making, ways of communicating. I think, um, you know, the definition of decolonization varies throughout history and decades of time. Um, they can even be as simple as being in a classroom and decolonizing, um, you know, a space at which you're sitting around and the business as usual becomes not business as usual. So sort of like undoing things. Um, and in that way, when I speak in indigenous populations, people that sort of um, understand what decolonization is, the, the second step I think is about um, indigenizing something about recognizing the protocols at which your ancestors or people have come from and um, leading with that too. Mm -hmm. so. so there's this idea that the way we've been doing stuff, creating work, uh, comes with a colonized lens, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the idea is to how do we rethink process? How do we rethink process in order to equalize power? Um, how do we rethink process in order to share power? Um, move from a top-down type of way of working to a um, circular way of working. Um, Heather, I'm going to bring you in. How do you feel like decolonization shows up in your work as you create the stuff around um, the stories and the history as you work with, with Ty? Well, it's definitely something that we've been doing since. I mean, I didn't do it before I met Ty. <laughs> it's definitely um, through Ty's leadership that we have been making shows. We, I guess, we've done a number of shows together, but we really tried this kind of circular inclusion mode, probably in New York on the Grand Honor from Sky one um, about two years ago. And we did it through um, lots of gatherings and um, making open space for gatherings and we would supply food and, and warmth and gathering people and then kind of collectively telling stories. So a lot of starting with circles, ending in circles, um, giving voice to every person in the room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's this idea of popular education that the expertise sits in this room. Mm -hmm. Um, we can learn from each other, we can listen to each other, gain knowledge from one another based on our own experiences. I'd like to show uh, a video where Ty was featured. Can I show the video? <laughs> and it should be next. No, I think, can you all see above our heads? Yes, yes. okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Snowstorm from Canada. 
Um, well, as the video prepares itself, um, <laughs> uh, and if we don't have it, it's okay. Uh, but I wanted to show this short feature uh, about Thai and his work, um, and specifically thinking about this idea of decolonization um, and how it shows up um, in your work in particular. Yeah. How are we doing back there, It's freezing. Oh, it is? Okay. Okay. Yeah, well, I think like a lot of, too, of what Nigel and, and Heather are saying, you know, even in terms of design, it's, you know, a, a philosophy of taking something like a, a parallelogram or a square, and what are the ways at which we can make that into a circle? I know uh, various artists have talked about this over time, um, even, you know, contemporary artists as well, because like I think with squares and parallelograms and triangles, although very beautiful in shape, there are um, corners to hide in those um, types of shapes. So the idea about taking those shapes and rounding it into a, one of where we're standing shoulder to shoulder, arm in arm, you know, hand to hand, where you can actually give space equally to every single um, person who chooses to be a part of that circle. And we've taken that and applied that to also not just people, but also the environment, because a lot of the environmental thinking is about you know, all, all entities matter, the plants and the, and, the, and the birds and the fish and the bugs and the mm -hmm. mitochondria, everything. <laughs> Nature yeah. tells us a lot. Nature yeah. tells us a lot. Um, so Ty and I work together um, through an initiative called Art Equity. Um, this is a shame, not a shameless plug, uh, but there is really, there's a national conversation in um, the arts community and specifically the theater community about how do we build equity um, as art makers, how do we have an analysis and a framework and shared language around issues that we care about, but the idea if we do have that framework then we can make art that is equitable, uh, we can make art that is inclusive. Um, and that art often tells stories that are equitable, often tells stories that are inclusive. Um, and so what we've been able to see is how these two separate identities, um, Heather's experience versus Ty's experience, um, how they come together and create what we just saw. Mm -hmm. So how did you two yeah. meet? Yeah. How did this collaboration come into play? And, and we do come from, yeah, we do come from pretty different worlds. And, in our friendship, then I've been also diving more, and like I'm also a big, I was saying a big history buff, so I'm interested in like the history of this crazy country called America. And so I, my in our introduction, I was I kind of meant to say like I am of European ancestry, and my and I've been diving into um, all of that kind of history through Ancestry.com. I've been very interested in like learning, wait, when did my ancestors actually settle, like come into this country? Because one branch came in like way early, um, during early colonization of New England, and then moved west. And then another side of the family came in right during the Industrial Revolution, when they needed all those workers to fill the factories. And so it's been fascinating kind of seeing, oh man, where are we at this time and place now? And um, and this can this this friendship that then is being coming into this work is so important to me. But so that's a little bit more of my background because as we you know you're saying you grew up on the res, you have your Oneida and Ojibwe background, and then I am coming from this country, this bizarre country of of histories. Definitely, um, yeah. And then also with that with the art family background that then my both my parents were using art to then try to be change makers. They were making they made Sesame Street with the idea to like unwind segregation, like to try to like you know, bring up a new group of little kids on on with rainbow um, people. Like so to try to like take off the segregation glasses that had that had been brought up. So anyway, that's kind of my background, a little bit more of where I was coming from, like kind of seeing parents that were using puppetry for, um, I guess, justice in its own entertainment and YouTube in a way. So just sorry to add a little bit more on what my background was before we met. <laughs> no, no, no. And then we met. Okay, now how you <laughs> We met in a special place here at CalArts, Tatum. <laughs> In the coffee house. In the coffee shop. So that's where we met. Awesome. 
<laughs> are there collaborations happening there all the time, right? So uh, CalArts, one of the tenets of CalArts. Show of hands, who's collaborated with someone on campus outside of a curricular project? Okay, all right. And if you haven't done that, this is why you want to do that, right? Because it happens after you leave this place. Mm -hmm. um, Tell me about you all's process as collaborators. Yeah, and it's interesting because we met each other. We met each other here, and I'd seen shows that I was in here, and then I saw more shows of yours at the Autry, so I was continuing to see you um, on stage. And then when I was, I was in Wisconsin, working on my show, so I was going, I'm on the board of International Crane Foundation, which is in Wisconsin, which is where Ty is from. And I really wanted to um, bring in more of a Native story in, some, in my work. Because that's another whole story of like, well, these shows I was working on were about the land and people on the land. And I'm working with all these environmentalists that were coming from a Western construct. And I was starting to get really frustrated that though there's, there's a, a elitism in, in, in our environmental movement that thinks, that doesn't relate at all to the original land keepers on this land that know how to make, how this land is, should be you know worked with. So I was getting really frustrated with these stories that I was trying to tell and I really um, I has, had worked with some Native American my musicians, I was working with Leon and Elaine and I needed I wanted more more. I wanted more. And so actually I think I called Meredith Lindsay Shade and I was like Meredith, so she came from the producing department here, and I was like, yeah. I need, I, I, what can I, you know, we, this, I need more authenticity in this show, I need to tap into other communities. And then, and then Meredith, I mean, I already knew you, and I knew you were friends, but then she was like, you should call Ty. And then I did, and I called you from, from Wisconsin, and then you said like, who? <laughs> <laughs> Heather Henson, what? <laughs> No, <laughs> it was great. We were like, like, oh, we CalArts, we had yeah. a common language, a common, yeah. you know, things to relate to. I think we texted for like a year, though, before we actually talked to each other, didn't we? I don't know, we were texting back and forth, maybe not a year, but a while. But it was so crazy, when I was in Wisconsin and, the, and you were like, but I'm from like, like, the band, like right up north of like maybe like six hours, five hours yeah, north like of where I was. Ten hours. <laughs> <laughs> it felt like it was right next door. <laughs> and um, and you knew Baraboo. I was in this little town of Baraboo, Wisconsin, dealing with these cranes. And you knew Baraboo, and you were like, "Your name keepers there." I don't know if you said that at the time, but you were like, "You know Baraboo, yeah. this little town." And I was trying to deal with like the grasslands and the cranes and and water. And I, you know, really wanted to. Yeah. So that's where it started, I guess. Yeah. And back home, you know, in small communities. You have things, word travels fast on the wind. So we have this thing called the moccasin telegram, you know, <laughs> also known as Facebook or these other entities. And you, you can start to hear about people like, oh, this person's really interested in native culture and the arts. Like, that's just very odd. Who would be interested in, you know, hearing our stories and our people? Like, who wants to know about us and what we have to say? about the water since there's so much resistance with community and the environment. So, you know, I guess like my role in that was to um, have long conversations with Heather about, you know, what are ways that we can together build bridges for racial reconciliation mm -hmm. within our community, utilizing art to bring people together. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, the, 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 it was very fateful though that first time because I was already I was at Baraboo trying to see if there was uh, any um, Ho Chunk dance companies that wanted to come in, and then they were telling me I should be talking to your your uncle, mm -hmm. and that was then before, and it was very yeah very sad because then he he passed a little bit after that. But I was hearing about your uncle, trying to connect to your uncle. It was it was bizarre, and I had like literature of him and things written by him, and I was and I had no idea that Ty was related to him, and so I was there. I was in Wisconsin, like trying to find like names of um, dance companies to bring to ICF and trying to like put this 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 puzzle piece together. And then there it was like, oh my friend from CalArts. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Heather, thank you just for sharing that transition from working with those environmentalists to moving to thinking about how these stories are impacted by native culture. Prime example mm -hmm. of how we decolonize process mm -hmm. um, in order to centralize and tell the actual story. Um, of how things come come mm -hmm. to be, um, Ty or or Heather, either one of y'all. 
tell me about a piece that you all have collaborated on in community um, and some of the, the highs of working uh, in community and some of the challenges that you may have experienced. Yeah, definitely. So one of our collaboration, we just want to give like a huge shout out to Mr. Curtis Mitchell here. Curtis. Everyone give Curtis so. a round of applause. of the beautiful kites that you see walking in and sort of flying around things in the air. Curtis is like all knowing of those um, instruments and tools that we use and is like one of our key collaborators in our, in our circle and definitely instrumental to a team down in uh, Orlando who are also there designing it. So, yeah. man, shout out to you. Yep. Um, yeah, so one project that we did do is we, we did um, a project with the Theater Offensive in Boston and they're an LBGTQ plus theater company um, there right after the Pulse Orlando that happened um, in collaboration with the, the Black Indian Inn, which is a home, a house that houses um, black and brown folks who are sort of going to school in the Boston area um, in collaboration with the Wampanoag people the people that just reinstated their land, um, um, known as today Cape Cod, right? Um, Mashpee. Mm -hmm. So there was a, a community collaboration that was going on, and then Ibex Puppetry. Um, yeah. So what we decided to do was bring in several different artists to this, and we were like, wow, we had a whole plan laid out, you know, um, of everything, of um, from starting to producing it to um, community engagement pieces and because of something like P Pulse Orlando happening we actually had to readjust some of our our schedule and our piece that we wanted to create with community engagement um, the house um, three arrows at the Black Indian Inn in Dorchester, Boston oh, Dorchester <laughs> opened up his home and um, said hey whoever wants to come you know and mourn what actually happened there a lot of um, LBGTQ youth were very, you know, upset and sad. So what we did was do what we do best is provide um, activities for people to do to focus on making um, by creating facilitated conversations. And then we decided, wow, at the end of this, we'll present this at this people of color um, picnic. That sort of was a more of a celebratory thing at the end. Mm -hmm. um, one idea we had from this brain trust of people in Think Tank was to make this giant sculpture of a dream catcher right in the middle of the city. Mm -hmm. And we said, wow, we're in the middle of this urban city. Where are we going to get um, trees? <laughs> right? Something I was like, well, normally I'd go in my backyard and get branches and trees. And, Curtis is like, well, we can go to, you know, like Menards or Home Depot and find them. Other people were like, well, why don't we just go foraging in an urban community to find them? But we were like, Ugh. we had our saws and everything, and uh, people said, oh, you can't go do that because you will get arrested by cutting down trees in Boston. So we ended up at the, um, the Arboridium of Harvard, <laughs> of Harvard. And we were there with saws, and we just looked like this motley crew of artists going through the Harvard Arboridium with our saws and axes, ready to get tree branches. And you know, we talked to the folks there. I didn't, but Heather and Curtis did for specific reasons. Yeah. <laughs> they let us take from the arboretum. We were allowed to take from their their like um, cutting <laughs> pile. They were, they were pruning. They were pruning. They were pruning. Oh, so you were taking so, Yeah. So they did let us take some stuff. But mainly, they managed. We were working with another woman. Said she knew which were the plants were the invasive, like unwanted vines, and so yeah. we actually went into another park and cut down all these vines that we were like freeing the trees because it was this horrible invasive. So actually, that's kind of interesting too. In parallel, it was a, a, a yeah. non-native plant, invasive plant that was attacking all the native willows. So actually, that was another thing, because you normally work with willows. Often the hoops are made of willows. We went looking for the willows, mm -hmm. and they were being strangled by this invasive plant. So we went through and, and got all these vines and untangled them out of the willows, and then used that to make our huge dream catcher, which we could never make unless we had the engineering skills of Curtis with us. Curtis, yeah. And then we took huge that dream and, catcher, and then yeah, we and went to the Wampanoag people mm -hmm. um, in their community, and we made our own paper, and they're the restoring the language, and the they gave us hops. shells. The, cool yeah, cool cool hogs. Hogs. Cool hogs from the Wampanoag, cool and so we had a big bucket of cool hogs, yeah. and then and then so we drilled those, and then yeah. we're hanging them off of the dream catcher, and then had people, um, we had different um, earth pigments mm -hmm. um, in the mm -hmm. four colors, 
the red, yellow, um, white, and black, and then people were writing things on that, and handmade paper, different things that people would make, would add to the dream catcher. Mm -hmm. So doing lots of work in community, yep. lots and lots of work in community. Um, tell us, as an outsider, we talked a little bit about this on mm -hmm. Thursday, mm -hmm. um, as an outsider in a community coming yeah. in, uh, what, do you tell, what do you tell yourself? How do you prepare to go into a space that you're not traditionally a part of? Um, well, it's been, it's uh, hmm, uh, getting lots of lessons from Ty, probably. <laughs> um, humbling myself, I think uh, listening first before talking. Listening, listening, listening. Um, ah, there's different protocols. Every community has different protocols, and it takes a long time to learn that. Um, on one of the shows I did with Ty in Milwaukee, we actually did a show with different five different nations and we were going to each one of those nations and kind of humbling going into each one to kind of learn a little bit about that one because some of them it's you bring tobacco, some of them you just, I don't know, you meet people and you try to um, humble, humble yourself because these are beautiful different, you know, these communities that are out there and I want to respect those communities and the stories that they have and the traditions that they have. And you're right, every community is different. Mm -hmm. And Heather and I had a little conversation about, although communities are different, each classroom is different, each boardroom is different, um, the values that we bring into that space are consistent. Value of equity, value of inclusion, value of diversity. Um, if those values are clear and evident, then the work we, we create, then in turn, <coughs> also includes those values. Um, I want to open up an opportunity. Do you want to add but, something to that? Just like a little thing about this, different communities. Like, okay, so I have a space in New York, and we open it up to a lot of communities. And so I've been opening up to, like, I don't know, we had some of these gatherings. And there's some protocol that I think you have to do, like, welcome everyone, like, I don't know, welcome people, or this, this thing about, like, what, what time to eat. And I was like, no, we should eat first. And then... And then do the things later, and then they were like, "No, we have to like make sure we gather first, make sure everyone's there, and we have to like do the spirit play first. And so some of those gatherings, I provide my space, and I am not playing host. Like I just really like give it the space over to Louie and Brooke in that case, and they run the show. And I have been learned so much by doing that because there's definitely like I would have like, oh, it's my space, you know, I'm gonna like I'm gonna make sure that I welcome everyone, but. Where you know these have to be on these things, but I, I've been doing a lot of letting go and learning and listening. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we got to let the community just leave; they know yeah. the answer. Yeah. The answer. Yeah, and then I go to their events too. That's the other thing. Like I've given them my space, but then I'm also going up into their events. I love it. Show up. Show <laughs> yeah, up. show up. That's another thing about going into community. Mm -hmm. Show up. Gotta show up. Mm -hmm. Show up. Mm -hmm. Support. Um, yeah. Do folks have questions for our excited guests today? Or welcome back, they're not guests. This is like home, right? Come back to home a little bit. Um, uh, I can take a couple of questions if folks have any. We actually could queue up the Two Spirit video. Oh, you can queue up the Two Spirit video. I think a wonderful um, expression and understanding yep. of, of, of gender. Awesome. Let's let's do that, um, and we can bring gender into the conversation. It's decolonizing things that were placed upon indigenous people in the way that this dance means that you can use your body and celebrate who you are, how your spirit wants to move. is that these all of these uh, these spirits um, are sort of presented in each person that you're not necessarily uh, switching from one gender to the next but you're transcending gender the hoot dance represents 
um, the interconnectedness of all people, how two spirits, as well as like other folks in the indigenous community, as well as people just in life of the red, the white, the yellow, the black, no matter who you are, are intertwined and interconnected. Not just people, but our two-legged, our four-legged, our wind, our rooted, the sun, the moon, the stars, how we're all connected together, and that at this day and age, that two spirits also have a space in that. I dance especially for our two-spirit youth so that they can um, feel reaffirmed and that they will have the, the medicine and the power to claim who they are and not hide. So when I do these dances, it's a form of a prayer, a prayer in motion, um, and that's something I want to give back to the world. also share how that part of your identity informs your art making. Mm -hmm. So True Spirit is, um, is a way of identifying folks that are have more than one um, gender. Um, and I think, you know, True Spirit is the best translation for, you know, um, LBGTQ plus. And it's that plus, I think, it, with the long acronym. True Spirit, um, is a term used in you know the Anishinaabe culture or language. Um, there are other words that are used, and each nation has their own way of identifying these individuals. Oftentimes, it's a cultural role and responsibility uh, for the community. And what I'm finding too is oftentimes it's a, a warrior society of people who are making art that are bringing people together. Um, and the more two spirits I find, I think, in Turtle Island or North America, um, more often than not, they are artists. They're also activists. They're uh, people that are cooking, cleaning, hunting, the whole thing all at the same time, um, because that is part of the role and, and responsibility. Mm -hmm. And if I remember correctly, when I was a student, uh, gender was a, a big conversation on campus, and I don't know if it still exists, current students, there used to be an all-gender restroom here on the first floor, right? Maybe? Yes, it still exists. Yeah. I mean, there was a big push also to introduce folks by pronouns the first two weeks of school, yeah. um, so that people can uh, self-identify how they want to be addressed throughout the school year. Yeah, that's really great. I think these kinds of, you know, institutional protocols for school are so important, and it's you know, folks bringing that back. Like in my introduction, if you spoke Anishinaabe, I said Nish Mani Tuwak, which means two spirit, or I prefer to be, um, you know, my identity I lead with is being transgender, or I'm transcending this gender. So, yeah. Um, okay, so I think we are closing down on time, and what we would like to do um, in just a moment, I'm going to ask one final question. Uh, we want to involve you in the art making process. Um, and Ty is going to lead us in a closing circle, uh, which will kind of give us a kind of end to this moment, this experience. Um, but before we do that, um, folks are here celebrating uh, a new president here at Cal Arts, uh, which is really, really, really exciting. Um, and as new leadership enters this space in particular, um, as we think about how our identities inform our art making, um, what is your hope for the young artists creating work here on campus? Um, and how do you feel like um, they are the gateway to shifting the way we create work? <laughs> I was like, Ty should take that. Remember, I said Ty take this one. <laughs> um, I'm looking forward <laughs> to this new presidency. Um, I think it was a great celebration yesterday. Um, I loved all the speeches. It was a great kickoff. On this whole thing, um, I yeah, uh, I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> I know. Yeah. 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 We'll get first time. Well, I think like it's it's um you know I love the title of this panel, Roots and Wings, mm -hmm. because it's you know the idea about uh, at, in a time I think there's an opportunity, right? There's an opportunity not to have uh, historic amnesia 
or environmental amnesia about where we've come from. Because I think like for future artists and people making this work, there's a future out there. And a lot of, you know, whatever religion you study, whatever culture, wherever you come from, there are prophets and there are songs and there are artists talking about the future out there to open up your eyes and expand uh, who you are um, as an individual. I think it's an opportunity to really, um, as our president said yesterday, to elevate um, and lift up, but to lift together, right? Um, people are like, well, who's not at the table? Who's not here, like, in conversations? Who's not here making art? And, um, you know, so I think that's a great question to ask leading into the future. And I also think about, um, you know, I think about the food that you're eating. What food are you feeding yourself so you can be nourished enough to lead the charge in conversations and the art that you're making? Um, and as you say, Nigel, set the table. Like, set the table for people and give them, you know, the opportunity, I think, it, um, yourself and others to have a clear, distinct message um, about where we need to go as a society. Because, um, you know, we only got one life to lead. We got one life to lead. And as uh, Lynn manuel Miranda says, you got one shot! <laughs> you know? <laughs> What's it going to be? So, you know. Thank you both. Thank, Thank you so much. Well, I don't know, do folks have questions? Okay, I got one question here, one question there. Okay, we'll do those two questions. Um, what you got? As someone who likes to tell stories, um, how how do you find um, to tell stories with or incorporate or uh, incorporate other cultures with that? How do you kind of go about that? Because it's difficult to uh, at least for me to be authentic and not trying to uh, separate the cultures or bring them together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I, I sort of think about that, uh, the idea of appropriation versus appreciation. Mm -hmm. How do we appreciate culture versus like take and appropriate it? And Heather, you actually talked about this in terms of going to the root at which things are credited, like stories, um, going to the source of something, of where it's made. I think these are some tools, but I do feel like it's a constant conversation with um, people that you're talking with, a constant mm -hmm. feedback loop and vetting mm -hmm. process of the art that you're making, right? Like, who does this art belong to if it's like, you know, comes from like an ancient culture? So constantly evaluating through questioning. Mm -hmm. And engagement, constantly reaching out. You know, that there's that term, not about us, without us. So if you're doing something about a culture, definitely engage partnership, collaboration, mm -hmm. um, community. Dialogue, feedback loop, ties constantly like checking in, checking in because you know with people it's mm -hmm. And it can't be an afterthought either. It's got to be something built into process to be very intentional, especially with something outside of who you are. Yeah. Question. One of the things I thought was really beautiful about what you're describing is just that consistency and value of diversity, inclusion, etc. Part of what I'm wondering is. And it sounds like your investment and focus is really community driven. But as I've been wondering more and more about narratives and who listens to them and how to sort of um, bridge the divide when we're a really divided country in this current political climate and the extent to which or how you think through and engage um, folks who don't share those values. Can I pick up this one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Only because, um, so my work, uh, I'm a producer, so I produce art for social change projects. So how do we use art and culture to talk about those big issues? Especially for those who are not on the same page as, as us, right? Um, we believe that art and culture really can shift how we think about things and how our heart feels about things. And if those two things are not shifted, then the, the work hasn't happened, right? People haven't changed. Um, and so as we build narratives, there is always that thing on the other end. Um, folks may just not be into it, but it's about building a narrative that includes talking about communities, um, includes the, the folks who are part of that community, part of that story, shaping and creating that narrative. 
Um, there are stories that are created, plays that are created, songs that are created, and folks are not a part of that narrative. They're not at the table. Um, they sit and remain at the margin. Um, so for me, uh, in shaping narrative, it still goes back to community. It still goes back to um, how can we be most equitable, most inclusive in developing and defining this narrative um, so that we can reclaim it. Uh, and reclaim it in a way um, that will hopefully allow people's hearts and minds to listen and, and be transformed. Um, I just was going to say that when we went to Nebraska, it was just funny because we brought the show out to Nebraska and when we did a little outreach thing at one of the nature centers, like the guys, like they approached us, what, one of the gentlemen in the, um, who was at an Audubon Center, when we came in, he was like, you know, this is a red state. It was like this bizarre, like, like <laughs> you're coming into our space. But we then did this great, like, community outreach thing, and it was this fun art exactly. craft. And I think everyone like enjoyed it at the end. But it was a kind of like it was a kind of a strange concentration. Like, who are these hippies coming in here yeah. in, our, in our neighborhood? Yeah. But we but we set up all of our tables and our crafts, and mm -hmm. you know, it's one of those. And had little dances at the end. So, mm -hmm. and I think <laughs> entering these, it. I think entering these spaces too. It's like we don't ever do it alone. We're never like a single individual. We're like I have to come face with someone who uplifts this value of a red state because I don't look like someone else, right? So it's you know this like shared values and mission of our team. We're able to sort of figure out these places that are sometimes safe and sometimes aren't as safe. And how are we creating art in these places too? Um, and that goes from like board conversations all the way up to you know things in the government constantly. Um, so I always ask, who's on your team? Where's your team of people? How are you shaping and building that narrative? Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. All right, I think we can do our closing circle now. Y'all ready to close? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, yeah, what I'd like to invite you to do if we're sitting and if you um, are able to do so or feel comfortable, we'd like to make a, a large circle and, uh, you know, sort of decolonizing the space, if you will, um, and gather together. And what we're talking about. We can bring the circle all the way around. Yeah, come on. Come on over here. I'm so sorry. You're back, Jerry. Oh, see friends. <laughs> yes. And if you're able, that's great. And if you aren't, and you, you can stay seated, and you still will feel your energy within the circle. So we're going to make a large circle. Yeah, we can go around the outside. Mm -hmm. Can we get some a little house lights on the yeah, let's wrap it around first. Yeah, thank you. So if we can make sure we can be linked to the circle though. So maybe we can weave it through here. In front of the camera. Cool. Yeah, so if you want to be in front. Hey guys, can we do this? All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to end with the round dance. Um, you know, the only thing during this dance is the person next to you on your right or your left side. You're going to get to know them very well. And during this dance, we just um, uh, are, are, are really not supposed to let go of the person's hand We're going to go in a circle. We're going to be dancing. So um, in this way, if you need to scoot oh, over and stay here the whole time, you're that's whole great. Thing. Okay. Um, if you need to be together, I mean, we're going to go clockwise in the circle, and the dance step is just yeah. a step, oh, yeah, touch, step, 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 touch, and um, in this way, we are feeling uh, each other's heartbeat, because when we, you know, boil things down, um, it's like this heartbeat is the first music or rhythm that you hear when you're a small baby inside your mother's womb. It's the thing, the heartbeat and rhythm of life that connects all things. So we'd like to end the panel and share this with you. As you pass by someone, don't be afraid to give a hello, or I always say, you can just give a holy what, right, um, to people, which means holy cow, or I understand you, okay, um, when you see and you pass a friend. So we'll put on that uh, the music there, Alberto, um, for this round dance. So here we go with the round dance. Oh.
Remember, as you walk throughout the world today, think about how your identity informs how you affect the world around you, right? Um, enjoy your weekend. Enjoy your weekend.